here, Wolfgang Lutz, um, and family here, colleagues and friends, uh, good afternoon to you all. It's a great pleasure uh, uh, to attend this um, stimulating, family, friendly, uh, and enjoyable conference. Sometimes conferences uh, are boring, but this is one of the most enjoyable ones. Uh, we are uh, celebrating uh, birthday uh, of a colleague, uh, not only for uh, his personal achievements, but also for the great contribution that he has made to our discipline, demography, uh, to our global world, <laughs> and also to the generation, to the current generation and future generation of demographers and people. Uh, fortunately, um, our colleagues um, and previous speakers uh, talked about uh, the great achievement and contribution that Wolfgang has made. Uh, and I'd like to begin uh, my presentation by my expressing my personal experiences uh, on Lutz's uh, uh, legacies. Um, after this introduction, I'll go to the main part of my presentation on Muslim demography, uh, looking at the uh, population dynamics in the Muslim world, um, and then uh, follow up my presentation with some ideas that we've um, uh, been influenced uh, by Wolfgang Lutz and his colleagues, and I'll end my uh, remarks uh, later. I've been thinking, and also you heard from our colleagues about uh, Wolfgang's contribution uh, the way that he has been looking um, at demography uh, and demographic research um, is really uh, innovative. Uh, colleagues have been uh, following up um, and doing things uh, 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 over the past uh, 50 years or so, but Wolfgang has looked at demography in an innovative way. He extended our discipline and has been working on simple uh, demography characteristics as age and sex, but also he has gone beyond it and he's been looking at population and environment and energy. Uh, he's been uh, building institutions, as you've heard, uh, starting from Vienna, um, Wittgenstein Center and other centers and institutions that he's been working, but also he has been supporting, strengthening and establishing institutions across the world, particularly in Asia. Uh, I'd like to uh, bring this up, the email that I sent to some colleagues in 2007, you cannot read it, but for the record, uh, I've initiated uh, an online forum for the establishment of the Asian Population Association, and I called uh, for discussion in the next week, it was in August 2007 when I was in Canberra, we were talking about the model of the Asian Population Association, and particularly its host, and other issues. Um, uh, four days later, uh, that's an email that I received from Wolfgang, uh, indicating that I have been thinking about Asian Population Association. I've talked to a number of colleagues, uh, but I haven't been able to succeed. And I congratulate you for taking this initiative. I'm coming back from Singapore and Thailand, where I talked to uh, Boston Limonanda at the uh, population at the Chulalongkorn University and discussed the possibility of hosting the association and that was it that uh, uh, we finalized our decision uh, that was really very important and significant contribution and now you now uh, know that the Asian Population Association has been established and we are talking to hold uh, its uh, fourth conference uh, uh, in two years' time. Uh, the establishment of the Asian Demographic Research Institute, ADRI, uh, and colleagues that uh, are here, that was an important contribution, uh, and also the meeting that we had this year to discuss the regional uh, collaboration uh, in Asia. I think these are all uh, the great contribution that he has made to uh, institutionalize demographic training and research. Uh, this uh, venue, uh, I think, is a great uh, evidence of his outreach, international outreach. Uh, he has not only been 
uh, in Vienna, influencing European demography, but, of, but also to other countries in the world. He has worked with many, and I was uh, also fortunate uh, enough to have uh, at least uh, publications on different issues that we had. Uh, the emphasis that he made on education and human, ca human capital is really a crucial uh, issue and important for the developing countries, uh, particularly uh, that they are taking and looking at population only from uh, by its age structure, but in fact is, as he expressed in his um, uh, papers uh, with others, uh, it is uh, attainment of education and investment on education and health. That is important. And finally, uh, I was looking at one of his papers on the uh, population policy rationale for the 21st century that he expresses the importance of human resources uh, with respect to achieving the highest level of uh, well-being of the current and future generation of population, but also uh, taking into account and respecting human rights of the people. I think. Uh, these are uh, the main and uh, great um, um, importance and legacies that uh, Wolfgang um, has had and will have on our demographic discipline and uh, to our global uh, world. Now let's um, uh, begin uh, my presentation on um, uh, Ali Skippy's um, slides that uh, he has, that is based on Wolfgang's and his colleagues' presentation, particularly uh, the point that he made demography is dividend is education dividend. Actually, it was um, uh, demography dividend uh, trumped by education. And I thought it's not possible, I mean, it would not be easy at this time um, of uh, after the uh, US election to talk about the Trump by education. And I decided to use uh, education uh, dividend. Um, what uh, he has made, uh, the point that he has made, as you noted, is that uh, people have been uh, looking at a demographic dividend from age structural point of view. But Wolfgang and all his colleagues uh, uh, expressed um, uh, by the literature review and also analysis that they've done uh, that it is important to, to, to look at the investment on education. If countries invest on education and health, um, that would be uh, the main uh, points uh, for uh, demographic dividend. And by uh, education or with the education, he argues that future uh, look different, uh, that I'm not um, going to uh, do uh, to in that um, paper in great detail. And this is the last paper that was mentioned by Jesus uh, on um, Education and Democracy that uh, we did um, in 2010 it was published uh, the PDR uh, and now looking at population dynamics um, in Muslim countries. As you uh, note, um, there has been a misunderstanding of the uh, population situation in Muslim countries and this is not only uh, the confusion and misunderstanding of um, journalists or the public, but also some politicians also have a misunderstanding um, on the Muslim world. We've been looking at uh, Muslim population since uh, 2000 by Gavin Jones and others, and recently decided to update um, our papers and publications uh, looking at the 2015 data sets, both uh, UN data sets and also uh, Wittgenstein uh, Center data, um, and uh, it will be uh, probably uh, finished by next year, but we have taken and we've been influenced by the idea of, uh, again, uh, human capital and um, investment on education in Muslim countries. Um, before I present a few slides, or several slides actually, on uh, population dynamics in Muslim countries, let me uh, briefly mention uh, what is in my presentation. First, uh, Muslim populations constitute around 23% of the Muslim of uh, the global population. Uh, secondly, uh, Muslims um, uh, or Muslim world is an illustration of unity in diversity. So there are. Um, uh, cultural, historical, and socioeconomic diversity in the Muslim world. There has been major social 
and demographic changes, including educational achievements um, uh, in Muslim countries. And there has been uh, some change, but further rapid changes um, is uh, possible. Um, Muslim demographic transition has led to a young age structure and demographic dividend. But unfortunately, there is a challenge that this dividend is not uh, being uh, used properly. And there is an urgent need for a, a suitable expansion of education to prepare for youth, uh, for their employment, and also expansion of uh, job uh, opportunities. Um, and finally, uh, gender matter. And particularly, it is important to invest on uh, women's education. And we have to act uh, now um, and start dialogue with others, uh, with policy makers, with politicians, um, and our uh, colleagues to invest um, on these uh, issues. Now, this is the um, uh, number of uh, Muslim population, close to 1.7 billion. Um, <coughs> they constitute 23% uh, uh, of the uh, uh, global uh, population. Uh, around 70% of Muslims are living in Asia, uh, close to half a billion in Africa, and the rest are in America and Europe. Um, and also another feature of the Muslim uh, I mean, population is that they are heavily concentrated in uh, some countries. These are the top 20 countries, top 10, and the next um, uh, 10 countries, um, and out of these countries that is, uh, includes Indonesia, Pakistan, um, India, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Egypt, Iran, Turkey, Algeria, and Iraq, uh, we have 70, close to 70, 67 percent of Muslim populations residing in these uh, 10 countries. We have another 15 or 16 countries that comes up to 83% of the world Muslim populations living in just 20 countries. And this is uh, actually including Indonesia, India and China with uh, large Muslim populations. Uh, Muslims are defined um, as a unique Ummah nation, and this is um, a pilgrimage in uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, but also they are diverse in terms of their uh, sect of religion. Uh, in terms of the culture and the languages that they uh, speak. And it is important to consider and take into account the cultural, historic, and socioeconomic diversity of the Muslim world when we are talking about Muslims. So, uh, and even within countries, the heterogeneity within countries is important. In Iran, in Indonesia, in Egypt, in every country that you go, there are many ethnic groups who have different uh, history and also they have different socioeconomic characteristics. So generalization is not uh, an easy uh, way uh, for uh, Muslim populations. Um, when we look at demographic or population dynamics, um, I had actually a slide uh, starting from 1950s, but this is uh, starting from 1970s. And as you can see, this is the world average uh, uh, rate of natural increase. And all, almost all Muslim majority countries, the countries that have more than 50% of the world of uh, their population as Muslims, were above the world average. It has started to decline by 1970s and 80s. There are countries close to the world average and uh, even below that um, average. Uh, several um, uh, factors contributed the uh, population growth in the Muslim world, mortality decline, fertility has been high, uh, and also there has been a contribution of population momentum that uh, they've been uh, growing and still countries uh, will be growing even further. But if we look at uh, the trend of uh, mortality, for example this one, uh, it shows that again uh, countries have had uh, very different uh, IMR, infant mortality rate, it has declined uh, tremendously. Uh, there are many countries now below the world average and there are countries still above the world average and uh, particularly there are the highest, experiencing highest infant mortality rate. 
Sierra Leone, Somalia, Chad, for example, and on the other hand, uh, UAE, Iran, Turkey, and other countries close to 11 uh, per thousand uh, live births. Uh, this is again infant mortality rate, um, and, uh, and this shows the uh, variation in these countries, and particularly the low level of infant mortality rate. Uh, as a result of this, life expectancy has increased, but it again varies between close to 50 in Afghanistan, Chad, Sierra Leone, and on the other hand, Qatar, UAE, Iran, Turkey, Malaysia, and other countries. So variation, and there are some countries above the world average. Trend of TFR is an interesting one. Uh, again, almost all countries were above the world average in the 1970s. Uh, and it has declined uh, tremendously, and particularly the focus is here. There are some countries experiencing below replacement fertility. Again, Afghanistan, Niger, Somalia, Chad, uh, having the highest fertility in the world. Um, in the 1950s, almost all countries above the world average, and now some countries uh, close to the world and some countries uh, above that level. And this is the percentages of the, the decline in fertility in the Muslim world. Some countries experienced 70% of their decline after 1970. So this is a remarkable change that has occurred in the Muslim world. Uh, this is an example of a fertility decline in Iran um, that, uh, as we uh, called it, the, uh, rapid, uh, the most rapid fall of fertility ever recorded. Uh, from close to seven children per woman to two children in less than uh, 15 years and close to, it, it started in 1986 and then uh, reached replacement fertility by the year 2000. It has been uh, uh, unanimous actually in, um, in both rural and urban areas. And as you know, uh, we, are we are now introducing pronatalist policy in Iran. If we compare the decline that occurred in some countries, in Muslim countries, like Algeria, Iran, and Tunisia, what we see here is the rapid fall of fertility just occurred in 15 years or 20 years. But in fact, in France, in US, in some other countries, it took 200 years, 150 years for CBR to decline from uh, 40 uh, per thousand to uh, close to uh, 20 per thousand, or TFR to decline from 6 uh, to 2 per children, 150 years in the US. But it occurred in Muslim countries in only uh, 15 years. And this is also an indication of rapid uh, social and ideational change. I've been looking at internet use uh, from 1995 to 2015. You see the remarkable change that has occurred uh, in these uh, Muslim countries, and this is also access to mobile phones. So people not only are educated, but also they're getting ideas from, uh, uh, from other countries and the global world, and they are connected. So this is really a rapid change that has implications uh, for their own country and also uh, for the international and other countries. They are mainly, sorry for, uh, I wanted to make these um, uh, notes a bit bigger uh, to be, uh, I mean, visible. Turkey, Iran, and some other countries are mainly unurbanized uh, countries. And on the other hand, other countries are still uh, below 30% are living in urban areas. So most of the countries are living in, or populations are living in, in an urban world. The social and demographic changes that occurred in uh, modern or developed countries have been uh, in a slow process. And they've been uh, acting, uh, and there has been a social uh, change that both demographic change and social change have been slow. And they have gradually been adapting to the new environment. But in these countries, there has been fast demographic and fast social change. And it has created an anxiety and conflict within those countries, and it has also implications for other countries. If you look at the age structure of the population, what we see as a result of those changes, Muslim countries are still experiencing a very young age structure. 
So the majority of the population uh, live um, uh, below the uh, world average, um, and they are between, uh, I mean, 15 to 65 uh, mainly. A few countries like Albania, UAE, and other countries are experiencing slightly high, um, higher uh, above the world average, but the majority are below the world average in terms of their structure. And this is uh, what we see in 2015. This is the world average, and these are the Muslim majority countries. If you look at their education, uh, on the other hand, there has been a great advancement in female education. Uh, the uh, the measure that has been produced by uh, Wittgenstein Center, uh, mean years of schooling for uh, all ages in Muslim countries, again, uh, Malaysia, UAE, and other countries, and there are, on the other hand, Niger, Mali, and Chad at the lowest uh, level. Uh, that's the mean year of schooling, and this is also for women as a whole. Uh, it is interesting to note that uh, uh, several countries, um, uh, the uh, female uh, mean years of schooling has increased, and also it's above the world average. So uh, that is another issue taking into account the human capital projection and education dividend that uh, World Bank is uh, uh, expressing. We've been looking at uh, the Wittgenstein Center data that they produced by education, and as a comparison, if we look at Niger, uh, that had high fertility, or the highest fertility in 2015, and this is the age structure of Albania, the lowest fertility level in the Muslim world. So what we see here, uh, the percentages with no education, on the other hand, Albania, uh, almost all, uh, having secondary and higher education. Uh, Pakistan having TFR of 3.7, and this is uh, the population with no education. Uh, that is changing, actually. And Iran, on the other hand, having TFR of 1.8, and uh, as it was expressed earlier, then we have um, less uh, population with no uh, education. Brunei, another example of highly developed and uh, high uh, education um, uh, attainment for people. Now, I don't want to go to great detail, but we are looking at future uh, human capital in selected Muslim countries, uh, like this one. Again, Niger, what will be happening, uh, it contributes uh, to the population growth in uh, Niger, uh, as it has a low level of education, but in Albania, it will be declining. So uh, the education has implication for future growth of uh, uh, population. And this is where Wolfgang and others um, have the next uh, population growth will be from Africa. And this is one of the reasons uh, behind it. We've been looking at Indonesia and Pakistan, uh, different age structure, different population, and also level of uh, education. Uh, we will be looking at this human capital uh, projection in the Muslim world in the report that we will be uh, publishing. Uh, despite these great uh, changes, uh, the uh, demographic and population changes, and also uh, um, advancement in education, there is a high uh, unemployment rate uh, in these uh, countries. Uh, this is a list of countries uh, with the female labor force participation. And as I said, uh, in Iran, for example, women's education has increased tremendously, but there is a very low female labor force uh, participation. Uh, this is uh, the uh, message that uh, Muslim countries should uh, use uh, the demographic dividend. Uh, and if they don't use it, it will be uh, a great uh, challenge uh, and profound challenge uh, to these countries. The gaps in education, skills, and job opportunities uh, must be addressed immediately, uh, especially for young people and women. And uh, if uh, the consequences for not meeting the demand is not only for their country, but also for the new generations and for the global world as a whole. Let me finish my presentation by this quote from Wolfgang Lutz, that 60 is new 50. 
this is the paper actually in the volume that uh, Samir mentioned, and they expressed that it has become a frequent saying that 60 is the new 50, or 70 is the new uh, 60, implying that people age 70 today are in many important dimensions equivalent to those age 60 some times ago. And this, there is a scientific evidence for that. So I will then by this presentation that happy 50th birthday, Wolfgang. Oh. <laughs> this is a photo taken in Nepal in 2001. And I would like to, uh, in appreciation of Wolfgang Lutz's contribution, I brought a little present from Iran and I'd like to give him, give him the first birthday uh, present here. Thank <laughs> you.